I love hearing about how these films evolve along the way. So first, can you tell me what the biggest difference is between draft one of this script and what people will ultimately see in the finished film? It's so different. Draft one of the script, they were like in high school by the end of act one. It was like entirely a a high school movie, Baxter Stockman was like a teacher at the school. It was so, it was so wildly different and uh, it just didn't work. <laughs> so we had to massively change it. Because you bring up Baxter, I'm just curious, was there ever a draft of the script where you considered making Baxter Stockman Superfly? Uh, yeah, no, that's definitely, and and that's, uh, I'll uh, uh, I'll tell you a secret. The, the reason the, like uh, the original design of uh, Baxter Stockman, uh, 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 the original design of Superfly was as a mutated version of Baxter Stockman, which is why the toys, which have a really long lead time, the Superfly toy has like a sweater and a necktie, which is not a thing appropriate at all for his character. Oh, that's so funny. I did. I'm surprised I haven't noticed that. <laughs> Hopefully no one will. And we'll delete this. So there's one answer to this next question. But for all the other characters in the film, which character design changed the most from beginning to end? Honestly, those those we all uh, uh, somewhat uncommonly in, in animation, like those are all pretty much what we got. Like we didn't really like uh, our character designer, Woodrow Wright White, just hit a lot of uh, uh, home runs. And normally someone will design something and then you workshop it and you workshop it and you make it a better design and you do that. And you would just do these drawings that were so expressive and fun and alive that were like, that's it. That's the design. Commit to that. Make it make it all the way through. I don't know uh, why this is my follow-up question to that, but as you were answering that, it was making me think of Mitchell's versus the machines and kind of the, the evolution you've experienced as a filmmaker. Can you tell me one thing about the process you used to make that film that you were able to reuse here to make this one, but then also the opposite, something that you know you did on that film and thought, you know, I can evolve it and do it differently and maybe better on this one. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know, like the one thing I learned and and continued to use is, is uh, uh, with Chris and Phil films, they are endlessly iterative. You you play to the buzzer, you keep changing things for as long as possible, all in service of making the best film possible. So it's like, I went into this with, uh, with, with an attitude of like, this is not gonna be a script to screen movie. We're gonna uh, storyboard it and put it up and change a bunch of things. And, and we will keep iterating and making it better until it's physically ripped out of my hands. Um, but on, on Mitchell's, uh, Mike and I, I think we're somewhat timid. We had never directed before and, and we're like, we could make this, what if we made it look kind of cool? And we, we tried some things, but I think there was always, if someone would say, oh, that's not technically possible, we'd be like, oh, okay, I guess we won't do that then. And on this film, I'm like, no, I know it's technologically possible. I will not compromise on the, uh, on the vision. I have so many follow-up questions. Uh, <laughs> first, I will say it's incredible that your first directing gig wound up being one of my top 10 movies of oh, 2021. That's... I adore that movie Thank so, so you. much. I got the little moose sitting on my desk and <laughs> oh, it's never great. going anywhere. I love him to death. Um, with that in mind, what is an example of something you do on Mutant Mayhem that maybe someone would have said that is not possible, do not do that, but like you stuck to your guns and now it's in the finished film? Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, uh, we had, a, uh, all of these characters kind of have a line around them. It's like often subtle, you don't see it, but it like breaks up the silhouette uh, uh, of the characters. And Mitchell's has that too sometimes, but not in all places. And that was a thing that, that we were told is just like, lines around characters is difficult. We're not gonna be able to pull that off or, or scale it across the entire production. And then on this, the team found a way to, to, to make it happen. And it just really adds to the hand-drawn uh, quality. This might be more of a producing question, but I was just reading an article about how rigorous this particular style of animation can be to see through to fruition. So as you know, the leader of the production, the, the director of the film, is there anything you could be doing in order to make sure like all your animators have like the time, the resources, the support they yeah. need to have like a really creative fulfilling process. Yeah, it was it was always like because uh, you know I I I went to art school. I, I consider myself an artist, and I know how how difficult and and vulnerable it is to make art. And sometimes 
you try things and they don't work and, and really like making it safe to fail, making it safe to experiment and making it safe to try things uh, is, is really essential. And I think it, we gave the artists a lot of freedom and were tried to be nurturing through their through their experiments, and so many of those experiments just ended up on screen. Can you give me some examples? <laughs> just like the look of the kid. There's a there's a baby. There's a joke about uh, 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 like sign my baby. That's yeah. that's in the movie. And if you look at the baby design, it is the weirdest, most misshapen thing. Uh, and I think uh, uh, one of one of the artists like did that in like five minutes, and we're like, we need a baby, and he's like. Here, look, here's what I can give you in five minutes. And we're like, wonderful. Like, duh. like he was ashamed, like, I don't know, is this okay? And we're like, yes, that is perfect. It I has cannot to look like wait this. to see it again now just to get a better <laughs> look at this baby. Yeah, get in there, bring binoculars, get in close to see it. Um, what do you think it is about this style of animation that's that's really striking a chord with people? Like, what is it about the hybrid, you know, 2D CG format that, you know, creates such electrifying storytelling opportunities and is also just plain old mesmerizing to look at? I think it's, it's because for 30 years, uh, CG 3D animated films looked the same or, or were, was a continuing evolution of like one style of filmmaking. And I think people... Uh, 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 and, and I think that that was moving towards like realism and perfection. And I think people don't feel perfect. Uh, we, we're, we're flawed, we're, we're individuals. And to see that represented in characters and in design and to um, uh, 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 also just see that much unmitigated artistic expression is thrilling because you feel the personality in it and you feel like, oh, this was made by humans, um, which is great. <laughs> Can confirm that personality shines through. It's got a texture to it that I think great. other forms of animation don't quite get the same way. Yeah, we, we really wanted that. We really wanted you to feel like the fingerprints of an artist uh, uh, on the film. I have to ask you about the process of doing the voice recording on this movie too, because I know you used an, an unusual technique where you had your actors in the sessions together. So, I mean, what does it take to make something like that happen? So maybe you could do it on future productions and can you ever go back to recording uh, with your actors any other way? No, never, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's I'm like, oh, this is, you know, in in the way certain directors become obsessed with like like Cassavetes, like it's improvisational and it's it's we keep it uh, uh, conversational. And I'm like, I never want to do a thing that's scripted or 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 in, in that way or or rigid in that way. Again, and and there were technical limitations, like sound bleeds over. It's really hard to do that. It's really hard to clean up the audio. I think uh, my hope is that if we do more of these, we can find a really good sound studio that can accommodate uh, uh, four to 10 people talking over each other at the same time. What is the biggest challenge to making something like that happen? Like, I, I guess, what is the main reason that every single animated movie doesn't record its actors that way? Uh, the, the technical limitations of sound bleed and just like what that does to recordings. Uh, but also for us, we're like, no, that's a feature. That's like, sometimes like if they're all, if you're just taking the improv take and there's an echo from a different character, that's totally fine because we're just, taking all of them talking at once anyway. Uh, and then I think also um, uh, uh, I blanked on I blanked on my second answer. The only, I'm so sorry. the only other thing I would think of is scheduling. Oh yeah, that's that's exactly what I was gonna say. No, no, yeah, it's hard. It's you know, with four kids who are relatively unknown, like they, they all have careers, but they're not, they're not, they're not John Cena and Paul Rudd and Rose Byrne and they're all in different cities and they're all filming huge live action projects where like, it was pretty easy to get them uh, uh, in a room together. I feel like no matter who you have in your voice acting ensemble, it is so worth filming that way, uh, yeah. recording that way. It really, like the results are stellar in that respect in this film. Um, speaking about your voice cast now, which character would you say changed the most depending on what the actor that you cast did in the session? I mean, the the, the kids did uh, uh, somewhat, uh, just because we had the idea of who the turtles were and then we, we uh, met them and saw the way that they talked and we're like, okay, this is this is what the movie has to be now. Superfly, Ice Cube, like uh, was so 
improv. He said so many things that uh, we we couldn't use uh, uh, in the film. Uh, but uh, uh, we, I think with everyone, we started rewriting the characters to to just the way people naturally spoke. Can you give me a, a specific example, whether it's Ice Cube or, or one of the kids where something they did inspired something that we can now look out for in the finished film? Oh, that is a uh, that is a great question. Uh, question very specific question uh uh i am blanking on an answer right now i am so sorry no it's all good it's all good there's i mean there's so many details yeah i mean i guess i'll i'll go there next is there any specific like detail in the animation that you know maybe isn't the biggest deal for the story or front and center for a frame but it's just like something you're really proud of that you hope people look out for when they watch the film yeah we we did a thing that's also really technically difficult to do in animation and isn't done a lot where we just use long takes because because it's that's and especially with four characters like you have to have an animator animate a shot that's like 30 seconds long and has four characters moving uh, 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 but it felt important because it not cutting gives you time to hang out with the characters and feel connected to them and feel like you're a fly on the wall of, of their interactions, but it also meant filling a lot of uh, space. So there's a lot of like characters talking and then Donnie like checking his phone while the others are, are talking. Like there's so many great expressions that are not what you're looking at uh, uh, when the other ones are talking. So I, I would just pay attention to the turtles in, in the long takes and see all of the wonderful acting that the animators put in. Makes the space feel like real and yeah. full and like it fully surrounds you. I love that quality of it. I did want to ask you about the choice to, you know, either respect canon or do something different and make this movie your own. So can you give me an example of something in Ninja Turtles canon that you absolutely knew you had to uphold, but then also a time where you're like, you know what, this is where we put our own original stamp on it and do something different. Yeah, I mean, like a like a great uh, uh, example would be, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the turtles were like, they must maintain their personalities. They must be... Uh, 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 leader uh, leads the team does machines cool but rude party dude like uh, we wanted them to feel like the characters that you're you're familiar with um, but you know like splinter has a different backstory in this film that has not been in other ones and the the which has changed in different projects uh, but that story didn't necessarily make sense for a rat living in New York City. Uh, there were too many elements. We just spent a lot of time like trying to make everything make sense and invite in an audience that maybe wasn't predisposed to like the Ninja Turtles. Um, and we just always tried to operate from a place of relatability and character um, and hopefully make them likable. I'm always impressed by a new addition to a franchise that will satisfy longtime fans, but also serve as an on-ramp for newcomers. And you do that here. And I think oh, that great. makes it extra special. I also wanted to ask about uh, Superfly's team of mutants. Did you always know that was the specific group you were going with, or was there ever any mixing and matching, trying out another character? Yeah, there there are a lot of things. Like we, our uh, our character designer Woodrow Wright, uh, I cannot say his name today. Woodrow White uh, uh, would do these cool designs, and uh, uh, at some point, I was basically just asking him to do fan art, where I'm like, I wonder what a Woodrow drawing of like uh, Ray Fillet would look like. Hey, Woodrow. Draw, draw Ray Filet, let's pretend he's in the movie. And then he would do it and we're like, man, that is such a cool design. Okay, I guess we gotta put Ray Filet in the movie. Like, let's let's figure it out. Um, and there were some, there were some characters like uh, Scale Tail, who's a like cobra uh, a snake that <clears throat> we wanted to put in. And uh, the, the, the animation team was like, snakes are so difficult to rig they're so do you have to have this character and we're like fine we'll we'll change it out for for, for a different one 